Hello and happy Tuesday, everybody. Here's what's coming up tonight on Now. If teachers want to be armed in the classroom, should we give them guns? I think it's absurd that people think we should have guns in the classrooms, to be honest. An online movement shows many educators hate the idea, but lawmakers are taking the suggestion seriously. The secret to delicious food is fresh ingredients. Maine grown kelp is healthy, locally sourced, and can even taste good. You have to be willing to to change everything, but it's it's not easy because I'm a felon. There's no taking that back. The road to recovery is difficult when an extensive criminal record shadows your every step. But she's determined to shape her own future. This is New Center Now. <laughs> Now, everybody, I'm Lee Goldberg. And I'm Lindsay Mills. We will talk about arming teachers in just a moment. But first, disturbing details about the death of a 10-year-old girl. Yeah, we have to warn you, the story should be and might be upsetting for a lot of you viewers. Police say that Marissa Kennedy was beaten and abused for months before she was found dead in the boiler room of her mother's home in Stockton Springs. According to court documents, Sharon Carrillo and her husband Julio admitted to whipping the girl several times a day and locking her in a closet while she screamed. Officials say that they staged the scene of her death on Sunday, trying to make it look like 10-year-old Marissa had hurt herself. But police arrested her mother and stepfather, charging them with depraved indifference murder. An infant and a toddler were also taken from the house as well. And police say that the couple had been flagged for several reports of domestic violence before. Neighbors say loud arguments were common. This horrible story begs the question, what can we do to make sure kids are protected from abusive parents? And what are the signs that a child is being abused? We sat down with Dr. Lawrence Ritchie of the Spurwing Child Abuse Program. Dr. Ritchie, thank you so much for speaking with us today. When it comes to child abuse, what are the telltale signs? Well, it varies uh, depending very much on the age of the child. Uh, when one's talking about infants, uh, and the type of, of, of abuse, of course, whether it's physical abuse or sexual abuse or psychological maltreatment or neglect. But when it comes to infants, for example, what we, what we look for are bruises or other signs of injury, uh, signs of not being cared for appropriately. Uh, with older children, we tend to see less commonly the, the overwhelming signs of physical abuse that we see in babies. Like, for example, in babies, we see head trauma, we see multiple fractures. Um, in older children, particularly school-age children, we might see something as simple as a slap mark to the face, bruising. Any kind of bruising that looks unusual, uh, because we know what typical accidental bruises look like. Uh, kids fall on their shins and their knees, they sometimes fall on their elbows, they sometimes bunk their forehead, but they don't typically get grab mark bruises on their face or their neck, or slap mark bruises, particularly on the left side of their face. Um, and they don't get grab mark bruises on their arms. So, so definitely looking for bruises or other injuries. I would also say that people should pay attention in particular to statements made by children. If a child says that something untoward is happening in the home, it's important for anyone who hears this, whether it's a neighbor or a daycare provider or a school or a doctor or a medical provider, when they hear a child say that something's happening in the home, that, that makes them feel unsafe, whether it's physical or sexual or otherwise, um, they should become very concerned. Who should they go to to report it? So, so very basically in Maine and in all the states in the, in the United States, we have a reporting law and, and the reporting authority is Child Protective Services. I would also say that if they think it's severe enough or urgent enough, they should be calling law enforcement. Uh, if they feel the issue is still ongoing, and Child Protective Services or law enforcement doesn't respond, then they should call again. What do you have to say to someone who maybe is thinking, I don't want to cross a boundary, um, this isn't my child, this isn't my child's friend, am I crossing any boundaries? What is your message to uh, someone who might think that? So in, in, in sort of cynical terms, I would say that crossing a boundary, if that's what you're thinking, is better than having a dead child. How do we protect our children 
In the classroom, after the deadly rampage at the high school in Florida last week, parents all over the country are crying out for action. The president and Maine's governor think arming teachers and faculty could save lives if they meet a certain criteria. I think if they're well trained, I see nothing wrong with it. I don't think it should be mandatory. I think it should be voluntary. But I, if I knew that a well trained uh, personnel in the school was there to protect our children, I find that to be a good move. Several of you agreeing with the governor on Facebook saying if the staff is willing and well trained, members should be allowed to carry a weapon. But so many who are working in Maine's classrooms are against the idea, saying that they need to focus on teaching. Several voices joining a chorus online with the hashtag arm me with. We don't intentionally train teachers for this. We are all caught up in it. Um, and I would like to stop having to, <laughs> to even consider that we would have to train teachers for this. This needs to stop. Dr. Flynn Ross is the Extended Teacher Education Program Coordinator for the University of Southern Maine. She helps prepare the next generation of teachers. That generation is determined to not let recent school threats and shootings derail their career plans. I can't live my life that way. I want to be a teacher and no matter what happens in the schools, I'm going to go be a teacher. In some parts of the country, educators are already carrying. This elementary school in West Plains, Missouri, started arming a select amount of teachers back in 2012 after the Sandy Hook shooting. Teachers who have concealed weapons permits and attended 40 hours of training class. Only the principal, superintendent, and school board members know who the carrying teachers are. More than a dozen schools in Missouri have followed suit. I think it's absurd that people think we should have guns in the classrooms, to be honest. The conversation of teachers carrying weapons has spurred an online movement, Arm Me With. It's made up of teachers asking to be armed with books, smaller class sizes, and classroom materials. I don't think putting more guns in the schools uh, is, is a solution at all. Arm Me With, sufficient dry erase markers, a laminating machine, I love that, a nice one. Um, you know, enough science kits to go around. Like there's just so many other things I would, I would like to see in the classroom um, and in schools aside from uh, firearms. Now today a Maine lawmaker introduced a bill allowing our teachers to be armed on campus, but legislative leaders quickly shot it down. Don Kerrigan will have much more on that coming up tonight on News Center at 530. Arming teachers is just one of the many gun debate topics we are tackling this week leading up to our half hour special Listen to me this Thursday night at 7, right here on New Center, Maine. It's a superfood, but is it any good? We take you out to the water to one of Maine's kelp farms and show you how local chefs turn the seaweed into a gourmet meal. Plus, and bacon, sausage, hash browns at all. Very simple. I really like that. Thank you very much. I'll put that right in for you. All right, our old digital diva, Katie Ortiz, taking orders at IHOP to raise money for the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. That when we come back. We are just days away from the beginning of Maine Restaurant Week. Did you even know that was a thing? One of the many participating restaurants is proving that seaweed is not just for sushi. Their chefs use locally grown and harvested kelp. Let's see how it goes from boat to plate. What's fabulous about it is no fresh water, no arable land, no fertilizers, and no pesticides. All we do is we come out and watch it grow. Kelp farming is still fairly new in the United States, meaning it started within the last 10 years or so. There's less than 40 farms in the United States, more than half of those in Maine. The one we visited in Casco Bay is about three miles off from the Falmouth Town Landing Dock. About three feet now, they'll grow out to anywhere to 15 to 20 feet. Paul Dobbins owns this three acre kelp farm producing nearly 100,000 pounds of seaweed a year. We can't go and, and buy some burpee kelp seed. It's not available to us. At Ocean Approved, Dobbins and his team developed the seed. It's planted in nurseries on a kite string before it's moved to a larger string in rows at sea. Kelp grows over the winter. When it's harvested in the spring, it goes to a facility in Saco to be dried, frozen, and sold. Dobbins says he's having a hard time keeping up with the demand. Just take a bite. Yeah, 
A half ounce of this will give you 105% of your uh, daily iodine requirement. To compare that to something else, you'd have to drink 24 ounces of milk. That's why it's served up in a nutrient-rich salad at Flatbread Company in Portland, which buys kelp straight from Dobbins Farm. It's a superfood, and so it made sense we, a long time ago to put it on our salad. Kelp, veggies, and a ginger tamari vinaigrette. It's crunchy and nutty. It's very mild. I'm not a huge fish fan. I don't like that fishy taste, and it doesn't have that at all. And when I was there at lunchtime, they were serving up so many plates of that seaweed salad. They weren't just making it for the cameras. It was, it was real good. for orders. Um, the seaweed tastes like the ocean, the fresh seaweed. I tried that. So was it good? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to be craving it per se. Okay. I didn't try the seaweed salad at the restaurant. I tried the actual kelp from the yeah. ocean. Well, glad you're doing that and not me. Exactly. All right, kind of hard to believe that it's February right now, right? Because Keith's mild weather forecast is coming up next. If I don't continue to do that work, then I will go back to using. And I know that. A purpose to keep her motivated, a loving family to hold her accountable, and a sober house to help her when she needs it most. Stories of recovery next. To break the cycle of addiction, each person has unique needs. Recovery advocates say that a job, stable housing, and community support can help. For Ashley Rennie, a sober house was the stability she needed. Her family was the support. While an extensive record, crimes motivated by her addiction, sometimes prevents her from getting a job, she hopes he, she can start her own career by paying it forward. Can you go for a walk? I'm a two-time convicted felon. Um, I was stealing from my family like you would not believe. Ashley Rennie knows how addiction can change a life. Checks, credit cards. I didn't care at that point who I was taking from, as long as I was getting what I needed to make myself feel better. Her former job, even her family, both victims of her struggle with pills. For 10 years, I could not help myself. Treatment in Florida worked for a short time. Back in Maine, she started using again, eventually turning to heroin as a cheaper alternative. The cycle of using and going to jail, her new normal. Yeah, I've been in Androscoggin County Jail probably close to 30 times. In January of 2016, her life hit its lowest point. My last time using, I actually overdosed. Um, it was January 10th of 2016, and I almost died. Um, I was Narcan three times. After leaving the hospital, she detoxed on her own in a Portland sober house. She says those communities changed her, and after a year, was managing a women's only home. Doing that has been, in my whole life, like my most rewarding job. Trailing her like a shadow, though, her criminal record preventing her from getting another full-time job at a nursing home. They called me in for the interview and everything, and then she ended up calling me back and saying, oh, we did your background check, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to hire you at this time. Her focus now is her nine-month-old daughter, Emerson. I just can't imagine now, you know, being so selfish, I guess. Everything that I do now is for her. I guess it is my motivator to stay sober, but that's my biggest motivation to continue to do the work. Because she knows how addiction can change a life. And so can the community support of others going through similar struggles. It's, and I would eventually love to, you know, down the road, open a sober living house here in the Lewis and Auburn area because there is no recovery. And I think that Portland really opened my eyes to how much of a loving family and, you know, supportive community a place can be. We might be able to save a few more lives rather than, you know, see a few more go. Ashley's been sober for more than two years. Coming up tomorrow, we'll show you more about how jobs and community support have become a mission for one main company to help people break the cycle of addiction and incarceration. Lee and Lindsay. It is so good to see those success stories, those positive stories, because we hear about the opioid epidemic every day and, and how terrible it is for our nation. So it is good to put faces 
to the happy endings. And the face of Emerson. I mean, just I could look at those cheeks. I just want to grab them through the lens. Yeah. 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 I've yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm heard that before. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like <laughs> being like a dad. Children. A little bit, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, we've got a lot to talk about here, going from the weather that I know you love to what might be more interesting later in the week. This is what Lee loves, and a lot of people over southern Maine do. Uh, officially 48 in Portland today, actually. 50 in Sanford, 51 in Portsmouth, and into the 40s, upper 40s, up into Bangor, Millinocket at 43. So a mild day today. A couple of clouds moving in now into the mountains. So there'll be some snow showers into the higher terrain and northern Maine tonight. For most of us, though, it's a quiet evening. Not a whole lot going on. Temperatures not really dropping all that much, right? Here we are around 10 o'clock. We're in the mid and upper 30s still, starting, of course, in the upper 40s to around 50. And then tonight we get down into about freezing or so before a warm front moves through on Wednesday. Now, Wednesday is a split state forecast because the front will stall out right here between Waterville and Augusta. And as a result, to the south of that, we'll be in the 50s pretty squarely, even some upper 50s possible tomorrow afternoon. To the north of that, in the 40s, still above average, but significantly cooler, and a couple of rain showers in there. A little shot of snow in the mountains in northern Maine Wednesday night in through Thursday. And then after that, things get more interesting as we look at Friday. Before we get to that, let's talk about the expected snowfall. A little tweak to this, it looks a little bit more like a higher terrain. We've kind of pushed this back towards Canada a little bit with the latest guidance being just a little bit warmer and a little in the way of moisture. So three to six for some of the higher terrain here, one to three to the north of Bangor. We've taken Bangor out of it for now, a few flakes maybe, but it shouldn't be a big deal. Coastline, nada, tomorrow night and into Thursday. Okay, here's the big game. There's a lot to talk about with this storm system for Friday. It is a blocking pattern, low, high, low. That means this storm has nowhere to go because of this high, because of this low over the Azores here. It has to sit underneath this ridge for about 36 to 48 hours minimum. That makes it a big coastal flooding threat. The latest guidance continues to be just to the south of us, but concerningly close to us as far as that onshore fetch here on Friday and into Friday afternoon. Even with this low position, which is hundreds of miles to the southeast of Cape Cod, look at the, the, the way the winds are kind of fetching onshore there out of the east, and it will do that for a long period of time through Friday evening in through Saturday as well, and that's a dangerous position to be in. Not sounding the alarms yet. It's hard to imagine, though, we don't get some minor flooding over southern Maine at least because we have very high astronomical tides 11 o'clock in Portland into York and Booth Bay. I'm less concerned with the mid-coast and down east Maine, but we have several cycles that we'll also be watching. So it's not just that Friday high tide, it's the Friday night, it's Saturdays that are all astronomically high tides. So, you know guys, I wish we knew for sure exactly how this is gonna play out, but for now we have windy and watching. It looks more like a uh, coastal, flood onshore flow event than anything. I don't see a crushing snowstorm in the forecast, but I think people over York and Cumberland County along the coastline in particular need to be very aware of this forecast because if it shifts a little bit, it's going to be a bigger deal for them. So we'll watch it for you. Yeah, and in, in, in addition to your suggestion um, with the fiber, I would yeah. say flaxseed is oh, a good this source of um, too? Good. fiber. I'm glad you're reading the banners. That's yeah. it. <laughs> very important. I still work here, I think. Well, yeah. as of now. Yeah. Yes. Anybody like pancakes? Pancakes, anybody? Prince yes. loves pancakes. Keith, you like pancakes, Not right? a good yeah. source of uh, no. fiber, but good Keith likes good the, what, the organic, gluten-free, <laughs> high-protein pancakes. Exactly. Yep. You God sure forbid do. you gain an ounce. We don't want to yep. go there. So. <laughs> well, they don't have those gluten-free ones that I no, have. Sorry, <laughs> Keith. But what they do have is Katie Ortiz. She's getting back into the swing of things for National Pancake Day. Let's take a look. It's National Pancake Day, and it would be a shame as a seven-year veteran of IHOP that I would not come in and help on the one of the busiest days of the year, actually. So let's check it out. Hi, ladies. How are you? Good. My name is Katie. I'll be your server today. I know this is very bizarre, but I'm here. <laughs> so I see you already have your drinks. Do we know what we want to eat yet? I want to do the Last year, we raised $4 million nationwide for the Children's Miracle Network. This year, our goal is to raise $5 million. Two copies. National Pancake Day. Please, please. Oh, okay. All right, boys, right? God bless. Uh, say Happy Pancake Day! Merry Christmas! Go! Cream, cheese, icing. Let's go. 
Well, it was about three weeks ago. It was 12.30 at night or 12.30 in the morning on a Friday. We believe the two suspects that did it had seen the huge jar of donation money previously. They broke the glass in the front doors, came in, grabbed it, and left. There was no other reason for them to break in other than to grab that. We had raised well over $1,000 already um, that was in that jar. We have two fabulous rounds of pancakes here. Seven o'clock until seven o'clock tonight. We're going to be mobbed, but you know what? It's for a great cause. It was, I still got it. I still got it. <laughs> that they were happy with their service. That's a that's a plus for me. But um, they so far have raised almost six thousand dollars for Barbara Bush Children's Hospital, uh, and that's you know in total from even like the three weeks that they've been fundraising, and I think today almost two grand. But even still, that's amazing. That's a lot of pancakes. A that's a lot of happy people too. The, I mean, you know, that's the food. Oh. Oh, so, so I know you were talking about the funfetti pancakes. Yeah, the funfetti oh. ones. I'm boring and I will go for hash browns, but you know, it's that's potatoes, okay. French fries, like the salty. You do love your fries. Yeah, exactly. you love your salty I just want fries. Bacon on top of bacon with a side mm. of bacon. Yep. And put a pancake. Whatever. I don't care either, either way. <laughs> either way, I'm good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very now much. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> I know. Seriously. <laughs> Cindy Williams has a look at what's coming up in our next half hour. Hi guys. Cases and cases of marijuana have been seized from a home in Lewiston. Drug enforcers say that the business was using Maine's medical marijuana system as a cover for its illegal operation. We'll have more. Also tonight, ever wonder where your family came from? Well, several companies promise answers in your DNA, but can you really trust them to find the truth? Those stories and much more The head at 530. Back to you. All right, Cindy, thanks so much. Stay with us more after this. All right, today's brain drops inadvertently. Lee kind of mentioned this today in the weather office when he came over to say hi. I went back on a hunch and looked at the last 24 months of monthly uh, temperature data for Portland. And the way I've categorized this is if it's a neutral color, that means it's between plus one or minus one. So just kind of an average month. Uh, we've got the red months here. And I don't know if you can tell on this screen, there's some super red months as well. Those are huge anomalies, so plus four or more. And so what I found is kind of what I thought I would find, which is there have been 13 above average months in the last 24. There have been three below average months. And the rest, of course, being average. And notably, most recently, was December. And we all remember that. That got dragged down at the very end. It's interesting that that's minus 1.7 as opposed to February so far plus 5.5. So even what seemed like a really cold month is nowhere as cold as this is warm, and uh, that has been a trend you'll see in a lot of places. You know what this all leads to, right? What does it lead to? Main Diego. <laughs> it's it's slowly happening. I thought you were going to say electric cars, where but I'll our take Main Diego too. It's going to be warmer. I'm feeling it. We have talked about this. All jokes aside, <laughs> as much as I go after the climate change, I say Maine could enjoy climate change for about 50 years before it became a global problem. Everybody else might be in trouble, but we would be liking it yeah. for we'll a while. We'll take it. Yeah. And the you animals would are another it. thing. Yeah. Exactly. You're breaking out the shorts and it's yeah. still only right. February. All right. We said our main at 530 <laughs> starts right now.